Okay, hirsutism is an excess of hair in normal hair bearing areas. Okay, so this is a normal hair bearing area uh, in the uh, between the breasts and other areas are also normal hair bearing areas. Now, what's virilization? Virilization is hirsutism plus male secondary sex characteristics. That's virilization. So it's hirsutism plus uh, male secondary sex characteristics, which means zits, you know, uh, acne, uh, deeper voice, um, clitoral megaly. That's the actual sine, that's the pathic mnemonic sign of, of a virilization. If the clitoris actually expands, and that should make sense because, you know, testosterone uh, did that, you know, uh, in utero to convert a clitoris into a into a penis, and so that should not that should make sense. So clitoral megaly is big time, big time finding in virilization. Okay. Now, in thinking about hirsutism, this is extremely easy actually to figure out what's causing it, because all you have to do is know this: testosterone, free testosterone, dihydrotestosterone is predominantly predominantly synthesized in the ovary. I'm not saying that a little bit isn't synthesized in the adrenal. I'm not saying that a little is. But most of testosterone in a woman is from the ovary. Okay? DHEA sulfate, dihydroepiandrosterone sulfate, sulfate, 95% from the adrenal. So therefore, and that is an androgen. Therefore, if a person has hirsutism, you only really have to get two tests. You get a testosterone level, and usually it's a good idea to fractionate it so you can see how much the free testosterone level is. Sometimes the total could be normal, but the free testosterone level can be increased, and you get a DHEA sulfate. And so if it's predominantly testosterone that's elevated, then obviously it's coming from the ovary. If it's predominantly DHEA sulfate that's elevated, then it's of adrenal origin. Now, most commonly, it's of ovarian origin. If it's of adrenal origin, then you're talking about uh, the uh, hydroxylase deficiencies, adrenal genital syndrome. You're talking about Cushing's or something of that nature. And as you know, these are not all that common, whereas ovarian abnormalities are. So that's the easiest way of working through hirsutism is testosterone levels, DHEA sulfate. DHEA sulfate up, adrenal origin. Testosterone up, ovarian origin. And one of the more common causes of that is polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is this. Okay. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, some people say, is the most common cause of hirsutism. Some people say idiopathic is, you know, whatever that means. Idiot, you know, that means like we can't have a cause. Sometimes it's just due to a little stromal hyperplasia. You see, the stroma of the ovary can make uh, uh, testosterone. Maybe sometimes it's that. Or, or sometimes it's polycystic ovarian syndrome, or other things that could be like tumors of the ovary, which are rare. The way I understand polycystic ovarian syndrome works is that it's a uh, the uh, it's a hypoblamic pituitary abnormality where uh, FSH is kind of suppressed and luteinizing hormone is kind of increased. And so if you know what luteinizing hormone does, then then actually that makes the rest of the pathophys quite easy. In a woman, luteinizing hormone is responsible for, for hormone synthesis around that developing follicle of the month. It's called the theca interna. And uh, in the theca interna, during the proliferative phase of the cycle, uh, what is predominantly being synthesized are the 17 keto steroids, DHEA and androstenedione. dione. The androstenedione dione is then converted by oxidoreductase into testosterone. Then the testosterone goes across the membrane of the developing follicle into the granulosa cells where there's aromatase, that FSH put in there. And then aromatase in that granulosa cell converts the testosterone into estradiol, and that's where the woman gets her estradiol from, from that, from that uh, aromatization process. So you know that luteinizing hormone is responsible for the synthesis of 17 keto steroids and testosterone in the ovaries. Okay, so you can see then why there's going to be hirsutism in a woman with polycystic ovarian syndrome because of the increase in 17 keto steroids, DHEA, and interesting dione, and testosterone. So there's no problem there. 
Turns out, however, that not all, but a good percentage of women that have polycystic ovarian syndrome, there's obesity. And any woman that has a little bit of excess adipose has ar aromatase in there. That's one of the main areas in a woman, actually, for aromatization is the adipose. And so I think you can see that these, these uh, sex hormones, testosterone, and androstenedione, um, can be converted into estrogens in these patients as well. For example, androstenedione is aromatized into estrone, that's a weak estrogen. Testosterone is aromatized into estradiol, which is the strong uh, estrogen. And so we have a paradox here. We've got a woman that has signs of excess androgens. She's got hirsutism uh, present, uh, maybe acne uh, that might be present. Not signs of virilization usually, just mainly hirsutism. And yet at the same time, these, these are being converted into estrogens, and so they can get endometrial hyperplasia and do have a risk for endometrial carcinoma. So they have a combination of increased androgens and increased estrogens. Now, it's the increased estrogens that, that will causes the continual suppression of FSH. Remember, estrogens has a negative feedback on FSH and a positive one on luteinizing hormone. And so you can see because of the increase in estrogens, you're constantly suppressing FSH and constantly enhancing LH and the cycle repeats itself. So you can break the cycle with a birth control pill because the progestins in it block LH. That's one way of doing it. And there's, of course, a number of other ways that you don't have to know for part one. Okay, so that's polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now you're probably wondering why they have cysts. These are the cysts that they see that you see in polycystic ovarian syndrome. Why do they develop? You actually already know. With the functions of follicle stimulating hormone to prepare the follicle, okay? And also to increase aromatase activity. Well, if FSH is com commonly is constantly suppressed, then the follicle degenerates and it leaves behind it. Come on, pick the hormone. Come on, where are you? You leave behind a cystic space where the follicle used to be. And so you have polycystic ovarian syndrome related to that chronic FSH suppression. Where are you? There you are. Okay. Oftentimes you can feel these by pelvic exam, but you certainly can see them by ultrasound, so that would be a very useful way of, of um, detecting these. Very commonly asked on boards, guys. So make sure you know about that one. Okay, in terms of menstrual dysfunction. Okay, we're talking about this. All right, uh, we have uh, the term dysmenorrhea, which means painful menses. We know there's primary, then we know there's secondary. Most common cause of primary is you have too much PGF. That's a prostaglandin and it increases uh, contraction of the uh, uterine musculature. That's the most common primary cause. The most common secondary cause is endometriosis, from my, my readings. Okay. Also, we have uh, problems with uh, what is called dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Now, what does that mean? Dysfunctional uterine bleeding, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It's, it's not a bleeding abnormality related to an organic or anatomical cause. So, in other words, it's not bleeding from an endometrial polyp. It's not bleeding from, uh, from a cancer. Dysfunctional uterine bleeding is a hormone imbalance that's causing an abnormality in bleeding. Okay? So, it's not an anatomic reason. It's a hormonal reason. Now, for part one, they don't go too far into this, guys. For part two, they go through all the way through. There are three high causes of dysfunctional uterine bleeding. One involves anovulatory cycles, and the other two, again, the woman can ovulate and have problems through with bleeding. That's called inadequate luteal phase, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, <coughs> inadequate luteal phase, and there's another one. That relates to ovulatory, irregular shedding of the endometrium. That's part two. Part one, if they even ask questions about it, it would be dysfunctional, uh, would be anovulatory cycles. And that's the most common cause of, uh, of abnormal bleeding in a young lady from menarche to about 20 years of age. So if a young lady in that time frame is having problems with her periods, in terms of too much flow or just tremendous irregularity, that's the usual cause, anovulatory cycles, okay? And what's happening is there is um, a persistent estrogen stimulation that's occurring on the mucosa and not enough progesterone stimulation. So they develop a little bit of hyperplasia. 
There's a buildup of the mucosa as the month progresses, and then eventually, because the stroma can't hold that, and then it sloughs off, and you oftentimes have pretty significant bleeding associated with it. So it's mainly an estrogen-prime uterus without the effect of progesterone, so you, you, uh, they, they don't ovulate related to this, and that's the most common cause of that. Primary amenorrhea and uh, secondary amenorrhea. We'll just give you the concept of this. Actually, it's relatively straightforward. All you have to do is just think about it. Okay. When you think about amenorrhea, you have to think, is it a problem with the hypothalamus pituitary? In other words, is the hypothalamus pituitary putting out gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or isn't it? Is the pituitary putting out FSH and LH, or isn't it? So when we think about amenorrhea, be it primary or secondary, is there a hypo, uh, hypothalamic pituitary abnormality? Two. Is it an ovarian problem? And uh, uh, something wrong with the ovary that's causing the problem with the amenorrhea? Maybe it's not making enough estrogen. Okay, so we have to say, is it an ovarian problem that's causing it? Third, is it an end organ problem? Is this an anatomical reason why this person is not bleeding? Maybe she doesn't have a vagina. Okay, that's called Rokitansky cluster houses syndrome. Maybe she's got an imperforate hymen. She's been having periods all along, but because the hymen has, is, uh, is imperforate, there's blood behind it, that's why. Maybe she's got cervical stenosis. Maybe she's got uh, DES exposure. So in other words, some anatomical reason for the, for the, uh, for, uh, the amenorrhea. Now, of course, that's going to be way less of a common cause in secondary amenorrhea because women have been menstruating. And so the one for that, of course, is, is the Asherman syndrome, where the woman's had repeated DNCs, dilatation and curatages, and they, and they scraped away the stratum basalis. So you have to leave something behind from, from which you can proliferate in the mutual mucosa. And if you scrape all the way down to the stinking muscle and you take all that away, then you're obviously never going to be able to menstruate again. Not only that, you're going to scar everything off. And, and we've got a woman that is basically infertile. That's called Asherman syndrome. Okay, so very, very simply... Amenorrhea, be it primary or secondary, can be a hypothalamic pituitary problem, ovarian problem, or end organ problem. Now, would FSH and LH levels just by themselves help us in distinguishing those three? I think so. If you have a hypothalamic pituitary problem, what would the FSH and LH be? Low. If you had a primary ovarian problem, what would they be? High. If you had an end organ defect, what would it be? normal. There you go. Okay. That's the way you look at it. Okay. And you can fill in the rest of the stuff. This is more uh, part two gets more into these things in greater depth. Now remember, the first step in the workup of any patient with amenorrhea is a pregnancy test. Let's make sure that we don't, you know, go off with zebra hunting there. You always have to go. Anyone see a zebra outside recently running around? Okay, so let's not go zebra-y when we have amenorrhea. Let's just get that pregnancy test, okay? And if that's negative, okay, then you start working on the other causes. We're going to talk about one of them, which is a very common cause, by the way, of primary amenorrhea, and that's, of course, Turner syndrome. Okay, you can see the web neck over here. Uh, in Turner syndrome, remember, the majority are XO, okay, not XX, and so they don't have a bar body. Okay, that's an act one. They have uh, defects in lymphatics, which we've alluded to already. We said that, uh, and I, may, I think we did, maybe we didn't. Um, you can actually make this diagnosis at birth by a physical exam of the newborn. You will see, remember that child that had dactylitis, uh, uh, the uh, sickle cell with the swelling of the hand? Okay, if you take that child, let's say, let's say that was a female child, and let's say it was a newborn, and you saw that swelling of the hand, swelling of the feet, that would be lymphatic fluid. That's Turner's. So if you see that swelling of the hand or swelling of the feet, and that's a newborn female, that's lymphedema. And that's a very, very common sign okay, of it. Let's make a fist. Okay, and you have four knuckles showing, right? So we'll count from the, uh, this index, one, two, three, four. The fourth metacarpal is commonly uh, underdeveloped, and so instead of having a bump sticking out there, there's a dimple. It's called a knuckle-knuckle-dimple-knuckle sign. So they have problems with that. 
I've had many, many medical students. They know count. They always count knuckles, and I've had get these calls. Knuckle, knuckle, dimple, knuckle. Knuckle, knuckle, dimple, knuckle. Who is this, please? And then they say identify themselves. Then they keep on going back. Knuckle, knuckle, dimple, knuckle. <laughs> In other words, you have a counter son. Yes. Very good. Okay. What's knuckle, knuckle, dimple, dimple? Is pseudo hypoparathyroidism. So there's little physical diagnostic findings there. I had one call me up. Knuckle, knuckle, dimple, dimple. Knuckle, knuckle, dimple, dimple. Okay, you got a pseudo hypoparathyroid case. And actually, they were the only ones that picked it up because they counted knuckles. That was pretty cool. So they had those abnormalities. Now, you're probably wondering about the wet neck. That's actually related to lymphatic abnormality. They get what they call uh, cystic hygromas. These are dilated lymphatics in the neck area, and they fill up with lymphatic fluid and stretch the, the skin. Okay? And because they stretch the skin, it persists as what looks like webbing of the skin. So even that's related to an abnormality in lymphatics. They have preductal coarctations uh, very commonly in these patients. They do not have mental retardation. Some cases, they're mosaics. That means they can be XOXX, and there's a remote possibility they can be fertile if, they, if they're a mosaic. There are even XOXYs also uh, that uh, a type of a, mo a mosaic that can occur in this particular syndrome. So uh, remember, they have menarche, they have menopause before menarche by two years of age. All their follicles in their ovaries are gone. Okay, and we call that a street gonad, and we told you already that that is uh, susceptible to not seminomas, that's, that's male germ serum tumor, dysgerminomas. That's about it for Turner's. Okay, big, big um, confusion about adenomyosis versus endometriosis in students. Adenomyosis is glands and stroma within the myometrium. That's glands, that's stroma, and that's myometrium. That is not endometriosis. It doesn't fit the definition. Endometriosis is functioning gland and stroma outside the confines of the uterus. Myometrium is inside. So if you have glands and stroma in your myometrium, that's called adenomyosis. Very common cause for uh, dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, uh, menorrhagia. Very common cause for hysterectomy because the uterus is often big. Okay? Very common. Okay? Uh, does not predispose to cancer. Endometriosis is glands and stroma that's implanted outside the confines of the uterus. Most common location, ovary, okay, and then it produces a, a bleeding in the ovary, and they call these uh, chocolate cysts, that's a horrible thing to say, or endometriomas, that's making it sound like it's a tumor. It's stupid. It's endometriosis of the ovary. Let's just call it what it is. Other places, it can be on the tube, it can be in the pouch of Douglas. Matter of fact, if you want to diagnose endometriosis, a great question to ask would be, Mrs. Jones, when you're having your period and you're, and you're going to the bathroom, does it hurt when you defecate? Oh, God, it's just terrible. It hurts big time. How about when your period's gone? No, it goes away. And endometriosis. Because what they have are bleeding endometrial implants in the pouch of Douglas. And so the rectal pouch, or the rectum, when it's filled up with stool, is going to be stretching that and it causes pain. So painful defecation during period time. And then it's not present otherwise. It's classic endometriosis. See, a woman won't volunteer that because she may think that's normal. But it ain't. It's endometriosis. So this is a, this is a classic um, uh, endometrial uh, implant that's an ovary producing bleeding. Remember, there's a lot of theories. Probably one of the, the, the ones that, that is, is reverse menses. And that means that the endometrial tissue, when it's being sloughed off, might reverse up the floping tubes and then spread out and implant itself in those different places. But some cases must be related to other things because if they're, I've seen them in the umbilicus, I've seen them in the inguinal hernia sac. I mean, you can't do it that way. So there must be salomic metaplasia, in other words, uh, the surface epithelium uh, in, the, in the peritoneum uh, could metaplastically make endometrium. Because it, oh, sometimes probably lymphatic hematogen is spread too. Okay, so that's endometriosis uh, versus adenomyosis. Okay, this is, you've seen this before, this is endometrial hyperplasia, that's an unopposed estrogen. Remember, it's always dangerous to have unopposed estrogen, meaning no progesterone effect. 
because then you run the risk for endometrial cancer. <clears throat> and this is the best picture of endometrial cancer that exists. And so if they're going to show it to you, this would be the one they're going to show you. There's a rectum. <clears throat> Beautiful example of the pouch of Douglas there. And its relationship to the rectum. You can see that if there was endometrial implants in there bleeding and you had stool in there, I think you can clearly see why there would be painful defecation. You can also clearly see why that could collect seeding in a woman that's 65 with an ovarian cancer. You can see why that could collect pus in a woman with PID. You can see why that could collect unclotted blood in a ruptured atopic. Okay, because it's just the, a, a low part of a woman's pelvis. It is the entire vagina, cervical os, uterus, and you can clearly see right over here a uh, endometrial adenocarcinoma that's extended all the way to the serosal surface there. Okay, this is the bladder. So the most common cause of endometrial uh, cancer is uh, endometrial hyperplasia, unopposed estrogen. So let's think about that. Okay. Well, we've seen it in polycystic ovarian syndrome, okay. How about early menarche versus uh, late menarche? Early, because the earlier a woman has estrogen going, the worst. How about early menopause or late menopause? Late, because there's more estrogen exposure. How about obesity versus non-obesity? Obesity, why? It's the, it's the estrogen factory. There's more aromatase in the tissue. So obese women are very subject to cancers related to estrogens, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, and for other, other reasons, I'm not sure, of ovarian cancer. Okay, so uh, there's nothing magic. Now, this type 2 diabetes thing, relationship, you know, saying that this diabetes is totally bullcrap. What is it, do you think? When they put, when these idiots that put down diabetes as a, as a risk factor for endometrial, what do you think they really should, should be saying? They should be saying that 80% of type 2 diabetics are obese guys, okay, and it's the obesity, it's not the diabetes. That is, that is really slipshod stuff. And all the books have it, including our little friend Robin, okay, that is totally wrong. It's the obesity associated with type 2 diabetes. Now let's talk about these cancers in age brackets. Remember we said endometrial is the most common, we said ovarian is the second, we said cervical is the most common. I'm going to give you three age brackets. Okay, you're going to tell me which of those three is more common. You ready? 45. Cervical, 55. Endometrial, 65. Ovarian, there you go. That's when you see these things. In other words, 55 postmenopausal is when you usually see endometrial adenocarcinoma. In fact, any woman that has, a, has been in menopause for over a year and then has ble bleeding has endometrial cancer to prove in other ways. First step in management, endometrial biopsy. Okay? All right. We're done with that. You've already seen this slide, lyomyoma. It's the most common benign tumor in a woman. And this is lyomyosarcoma over here, which is basically a mitosis count. Uh, it's the most common sarcoma of the, uh, of the uterus, but I've maybe seen two or three cases in my entire life. I sincerely doubt if they'd waste their time asking a question on myosarcoma. As, like, as all sarcomas are the big, bulky tumors, so I sincerely doubt they would ask it. But I will tell you this, they are, lyomyomas are not a precursor for lyomyosarcoma. I will tell you that for sure. They're totally different processes. This is an ectopic pregnancy. That is an ovary right there. This is the tube. There's the blood, the rupture. And there's a little, little embryo right there. Okay. Now, part two really hits ectopic pregnancies. Part one, we'll talk about a young lady that has a sudden onset of severe lower abdominal pain. Okay. And you have to at least think about doing a pregnancy test in this situation to rule out an ectopic pregnancy. That's about as far as it gets. Uh, for part one. Part two is going to really get into this thing in terms of, um, you know, using trans, uh, transvaginal ultrasounds and all that kind of stuff, but not part one. Part one just wants you to recognize if a young woman has a sudden onset of lower abdominal pain, that one of the things in your differential should be a uh, beta HCG to rule out a ectopic pregnancy. Okay? That's all they do for one. Okay, ovarian uh, uh, masses. Okay. This is another area that really confuses students. You know, there's the classification. See, women are so complex. I think well, guys would agree that women are complex. 
Okay, because actually when you when you come home and you say, Donny, how was your day? Okay, fine. Is that a fine day? Mm -mm, that wasn't. But she said fine. She said it wrong. She said fine. See, now most guys in this world, when someone says fine, okay, and they go and they watch the TV and all that stuff, and they leave the woman there standing. He doesn't love me. And then when they say, and they say, you never, you, you, you never talk to me. You don't understand me. I said, you said you were fine, sweetheart. See, men are very rational and stupid. They actually accept that. Now she said, fine. Okay, now that's more than likely a good day, but it's fine. That's not a good day. Okay, so what does that mean? That's the time to just hug her. You hug her, you know, you hug her, and then you say, oh, sweetheart, okay. Not in a patronizing way like I did there, because that won't work, okay. Just say, okay. I said, I get the feeling that maybe it wasn't a good day, and then there's a little shivering that occurs. <laughs> that's, that's the early stages of crying, okay. So you know that you are right. And then you just keep on saying, please tell me, I'm very interested in what happened to your dad. Okay? Okay. Just let it go. Let him talk. Let him get it all out. And the next thing you know, they're smiling about 10, 15 minutes later. Okay? That's a normal female characteristic, guys. Okay, they are complex dudes, and they're tumors of the ovary R2. Men's are just germ cell tumors, which you probably would expect. Okay, but when we're talking about females, they got them all. They got surface derived. What the heck does that mean? That means they derive from the lining of the ovary. They derive from the lining, the, the, the serosal surface of the ovary. They derive from that. They're surface derived. That's what surface means. It doesn't mean inside. It means surface. And then we have germ cell types. They're pretty similar to the ones that men have. In fact, they're exactly the same. They get yolk sac tumors. They get, they call them dysgerminomas. They get teratomas just like men do. So those are germ cells. So we get the same. And then we get, they get these weird old things called sex cord stromal tumors. Now, they're, they're very uncommon, but they're the dudes that some of which can make estrogens, you know, like uh, uh, granulosa cell tumors. They can make estrogens, and so a woman can have hyperestrogenism and bleeding and endometrial cancers. And some of the little dudes make androgens, sertoli lytic cell tumors. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that a sertoli lytic cell tumor of the ovary, lytic, is going to be associated with virilization hirsutism or Leydig cell tumor. Duh! I mean, there's no problem with those. You know they're going to do that. So they have surface-derived germ cells and sex cord stromals. Well, we mainly, guys, have just germ cell tumors. So let's go through them quickly. Now, what is the most common cause of an ovarian mass in a young woman? A follicular cyst. That's what this is. This is not a neoplasm. This is a, uh, a follicle that had ruptured and then an accumulated fluid. It got to a certain size and it's palpable as a mass. It's a very common cause of sudden onset of pain in a woman, young lady, okay, because they can rupture and the this fluid, even though it's sterile, produces a peritonitis. And it's really bad when it occurs on the right side because then you're thinking about, is this appendicitis? Is this a ruptured ectopic? Is this peritonic inflammatory disease? Is this a ruptured follicular cyst? The differential becomes very interesting when it's on the right. Ultrasound will help you big time. Of course, beta ATG will help you big time too, won't it? Okay, so this is your most common overall ovarian mass. Under uh, 35 years of age, most ovarian masses are benign. Over 35 years of age, most ovarian masses uh, have a greater potential of being malignant. Now let's look at some of the common ones. We're going to start with the surface derived, which is the overall most common one, and we're going to only look at the most common surface derived one. That's all. That's all that's important for part one, and that's the serous cyst adenoma, which is the benign one, serous cyst adenocarcinoma, which is malignant. Okay, so that's your most common overall Benign and malignant 
ovarian tumor. Serous cyst adenoma benign, serous cyst adenocarcinoma malignant. And it's got some other most common. Now, is it the most common benign and malignant, respectively? It's also the one that the ones that are most commonly bilateral. And the adenocarcinoma one has sonoma bodies, these little bluish uh, concretions here. Basically, it's apoptosis, destruction of the tumor cell, and replacement by dystrophic calcification. That's what a sonoma body is. Okay. So the serous cyst adenocarcinoma has sonoma bodies in it. It's the first one of the three that you're going to see today. You're going to see another one when we do endocrine, and you're going to see it in a papillary carcinoma of the thyroid, and then you're going to see it towards the end of today in a meningioma. Okay, you see some MoMA bodies. So the serous tumors are the most common benign and malignant, respectively, the most common ones that are bilateral, and in terms of the adenocarcinoma one, has some MoMA bodies. That's it. That's what you need to know. So you've got a 65-year-old woman. She's got bilateral ovarian enlargement, what does she have? She has serous cyst adenocarcinoma. She's the right age, and it's bilateral. There you go. By the way, here's a pearl for you. Any woman that's over 55 that you can palpate their ovaries on either side is cancer to proven otherwise. Because a, uh, a woman that's postmenopausal should, they're going under, they're going to atrophy at the ovaries. So if you can palpate an ovary in a woman over 55, it's cancer and to proven otherwise. Always evaluate that. That's not, that's not normal. <laughs> so in other words, that'll help you on boards, right? Got a 62 year old woman and she's got a, an ovarian mass on the right. Boop! <laughs> okay? You already know and then something bad. Because they shouldn't have a palpable ovary. Here's that good uh, uh, grouping of uh, what is basically uh, cystic fibroma. You've seen this already. It's not fibroma. A cystic teratoma. You've seen this one already. There's a tooth. This is the most common overall germ cell tumor. It's usually benign. And here's some histologic sections through it. You can see sebaceous glands over there. You can see cartilage over here. You can see skin over here. This one looks like it's making a thyroid. I call those struma ovaries. They can actually make thyroid gland. They can do anything they want. They're germ cell tumors. Okay? They're kind of interesting things. It's a, 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 a grouping of sex cord stromal types of tumors. Here's your most common one. These are called fibromas. They're totally benign. And this is the Meg syndrome. The Meig syndrome, M-E-I-G syndrome. I like that. That's an ovarian fibroma, which is benign, ascites, and a right-sided pleural effusion. You take the ovary out, the tumor out, and it goes away. Very interesting, Mike syndrome. This is a granulosa cell tumor of the ovary. It's a low-grade malignant tumor. And there's, now, that's, that's an easy one to remember. For estrogen, what does the granulosa cell normally do? It aromatizes estrogens, and, I mean, androgens and estrogen. So a granulosa cell tumor would more than likely be what? Estrogen-producing. Very, very simple stuff. Okay? And, of course, you've seen this before. What is this? Those are signet ring cells. Does that mean that that primary ovarian cancer, or does it mean that it's metastasis from some other site? Metastasis from some other site. Could you tell me where that site is? The, over, uh, the uh, stomach. Okay? What do we call this tumor? Krukenberg. There is no primary ovarian cancer that has signet ring cells. So if you see these, there is no way that's a primary cancer of the ovary. No way. That's clearly metastasis, most commonly stomach. This is chorionic villus. Okay, I want you to tell me what the outside layer is called, please. Syncytial trophoblasts. I want you to tell me what these clear cells are underneath it. Cytotrophoblasts. Which one's making a hormone? Syncytial trophoblasts. And name two hormones it's making. Beta HCG and human placental lactogen, the so-called growth hormone of pregnancy. Very good. And then here's the myxomatous stroma of the chorionic villus, and here are the vessels. Now, what will these vessels eventually coalesce into? Umbilical vein, and they have, of course, the highest oxygen content. See, these things, if, if, if this was, if this was in, in situ right now, all this stuff in here would be blood, and this thing would be sticking into it, and, and, and oxygen would be diffusing through these membranes here and eventually get into the uh, plasma over here where it would increase the partial pressure, and that's... So that's where that's where the oxygen would, would be for delivery to the baby. Okay, it's the chorionic villus. Now there's neoplasms of these, benign and malignant. You've seen this one before. What is this, please? That's a hydatidiform mole. Okay, they can be complete. 
They can be partial. Complete moles are 46XX, and both X chromosomes come from daddy. That's called androgenesis. Partial, a partial mole is a triploid. They have 69 chromosomes. Okay. And can have uh, a fetus present in them. Which of the two has a greater propensity for moving on into a chorial carcinoma? The, the complete moles. Partial moles don't. Complete moles have a, of all the causes of chorial carcinoma, which is what this is down here, 50% of the time is from a pre-existing hydatidiform mole. 25% ch chance from a spontaneous abortion. 25% chance from a normal pregnancy. Okay, that's the statistic. Now, hydatidiform moles of benign tumors of the chorionic villus, chorial carcinomas, are a malignancy of the trophoblastic tissue. This tissue, not this, this tissue is malignant in a chorial carcinoma. You do not see chorionic villi in a chorial carcinoma, only trophoblastic tissue. Remember, it loves to go to the lungs, okay, and it responds fantastically to chemotherapy and can go away even in the presence of metastasis. All right, breast lesions. Breast lesions. Here's the way they like to do this, guys. Can you picture a schematic that shows the nipple, shows the lactiferous duct, shows the major ducts, shows the terminal lobules where milk is made, and it shows the stroma around this thing. Then you can see A, B, C, D, E, and F for these different locations of the breast and the stroma. Can you see it? I can. Okay, I can see it. You do? Right now? Yeah, as a matter of fact, right now. I've got an image of it in my head. So do you think maybe what they're after is that you know where some of the more common breast lesions are located, which is like so. So if I said nipple, what would you say? Paget's disease of the breast. If I said lactiferous duct, what would you say? Intraductal papilloma, the most common cause of a bloody nipple discharge in a woman under 50. It's just a benign little papillary tumor right in that leptiferous duct. If you press on it, you can see the blood come right out of that one hole there in the areola. Okay, if you're talking about the major ducts in the breast, that's where most of the breast cancers arise from. Invasive ductal cancers and medullary carcinomas, mucinous carcinomas, they arise from the major ducts. Then we go down to those terminal lobules there where breast milk is normally made, and we have the most common tumor down there. It's called lobular cancer, lobular carcinoma. And it's famous because of its bilaterality. So in other words, lobular carcinoma is to the breast as serous tumors are to the ovary in terms of their bilaterality. As a matter of fact, in the old days, when a biopsy was done on the breast and we said it was lobular cancer, they would do a, a, a mirror image biopsy on the, on the same quadrant on the opposite side to see if there was a cancer there. They don't do that anymore. They basically have mammography now so they can check that out anyway. Unfortunately, mammography doesn't pick up lobular cancers though. So you've got to be, just have, well, that's a little bit of a rough diagnosis to make. Okay, what's the most common cause of a mass of the breast in a woman under 50? You're looking at it. Fibrocystic change. What's the most common cause of a mass in the breast of a woman over 50? Cancer. Not only cancer, infiltrating ductal carcinoma. Not, not intraductal, infiltrating ductal carcinoma. In other words, what does that mean? That means that we're not picking up the cancer early enough by mammography and picking it up in the introductal phase means our, our techniques are insensitive because we're missing this, that ductal stage and, and we're picking it up only when it's invaded. We need to pick up five millimeter masses and less to do that. Okay? In some areas of the world, like Sweden, they can do that. They got some dude there that's got this unbelievable stuff and he can diagnose it when it's five millimeters, whereas most of the people in this country can't unless the thing's just about through the breast for crying out loud. This dude can pick it up. I actually heard him lecture. 
And uh, it's incredible. He can pick them up at five millimeters, and he's got great results because most of the cancers they're finding are introductal, and they have excellent prognoses. In this country, we just don't get it for some reason. I don't know why. Okay. How about a woman, 35, a movable mass in the breast, uh, kind of gets a little bit bigger during the... Uh, as the cycle progresses, and then, uh, what is that, fibroadenoma, there you go. Those are the most common in terms of locations and in terms of statistics on age. Very important, because if you know those, most of the time you get the answer right off the bat. This fibrocystic change, this has got two of the four things. There's a big cyst, there's a cyst there, and there's the fibrous tissue. These are those lumpy, bumpy things that you feel in your breast that are kind of painful. They get worse as the, as the cycle goes on and then they kind of dwindle down because they're hormone sensitive. Okay. Another feature that you can see is ductal hyperplasia. And that's, of course, the precursor lesion for cancers, as you would guess, because those are the estrogen-sensitive epithelial cells. The epithelial cells lining the ducts are estrogen-sensitive, just like the glands in the endometrium are estrogen-sensitive. The glands lining the ducts are estrogen-sensitive, so that makes sense. And then there's this thing called sclerosing adenosis, which is in the terminal lobules that they always give to first-year pathology residents, and they call it invasive cancer all the time, when in reality it's sclerosing adenosis, a benign uh, part of fibrocystic change. So this, is, this picture's been on many exams. You see cysts? That's what it is. Don't make it any harder than it is. Better look at this. This is the most common tumor that moves around in a woman's breast under 35. So what is it? Fibroadenoma. Now, is the neoplastic component the glands here or this, this, this stroma here? The answer is the stroma. It's the stroma that's neoplastic, and what it's doing is that as it grows, as it compresses the glit, the ducts down, so they kind of have slit-like spaces. It's very easy diagnosis to make, um, and they're very, very common. My daughter's got a few of them, okay? Now, if you do feel a movable mass, you don't say it's just a fibroadenoma, just leave it there. You still have to go through the motions of getting a needle biopsy of it, and then if it's positive, they remove them at some time or other. You just don't, you just, don't just say that. Ah, has to be a fibroadenoma. Never play, never play games with that. You might be wrong. This is uh, the two best pictures of breast cancer that they are in the pathology slide set. So if they were to show you one, it'd be one of these two. Uh, how do you know this is breast cancer? Well, that's a nipple, guys. And notice it's being sucked down. Don't you get the feeling that this thing is hard as a rock? Because look, the fat around this thing is, is kind of like bulging around it. And you get the feeling that must be hard when you touch it. And that's true. That's because when, when, when breast cancers invade stroma, they elicit a fibroblastic and elastic tissue response to it, so it makes it hard. Good! Because that makes it palpable. So that's good, because that's what makes it palpable. And that's why they, if they describe a woman that's over 50, she's got a painless, palpable mass. It's cancer. If it's painful and they're under 50, that's rarely if ever cancer. The magic word is painless. Painless over 50, cancer. Painful under 50, some inflammatory lesion, fat necrosis or something, fibrocystic change or something like that. Very important. Now, why is it that the outer quadrants of the breast are the most common location? Because that's where most breast tissue normally is. There's nothing magic about why that is. The outer quadrants of the breast is where most breast tissue is. Therefore, that would obviously be the most common site for breast cancer. The second most common site is right around the areola. So that would be the second most common site. So there's nothing magic about why it's outer quadrant that's the most common location. That's where most breast tissue normally is. So here we see a nipple being sucked in and all that. And here we see um, just this kind of stellate appearing whitish mass here that is absolutely classic for invasive cancer. On a mammography, they would see this as a density, and they'd see these little spicules coming out. If I had to guess, there's probably a little bit of fine calcification in there, and they'd say highly predictive for uh, cancer. Now, guys, on part two, let me just tell you, there are lots of ways of skinning a cat. There's lots of ways of making a diagnosis. 
But I'm going to tell you the way the boards want you to answer this question. What's your first step in management of a palpable mass in the breast? The answer is fine needle aspiration. It is not ultrasound. It is not thermography. It is fine needle aspiration of the breast. And you've got to read New England Journal of Medicine article on that because that's the first step in management. Why? You can make a diagnosis and you can tell whether it's solid or cystic. And that also applies to what's your first step in management of a cold nodule in the thyroid. Fine needle aspiration. Not ultrasound. Well, that's the way I do it. Good. Then you put it down. You're going to get it wrong. Is it wrong what you're doing? No. But is that what they want? Nope. They want a fine needle aspiration because you can tell, get a diagnosis, and you can tell whether it's solid or cystic. Get more for your money with it. Ultrasound just tells you whether it's solid or cystic. Doesn't get a hill of beans uh, information whether it's malignant or benign. Okay, this is what intraductal cancer looks like over here kind of has this net-like arrangement. This is called comedocarcinoma because when you cut across these things, it's kind of like this junk that comes out, kind of like cageous necrosis, just like when you have a zit, you know, and you press on it, this junk comes out, and so that's why they call it comedo, reminding you of a zit uh, carcinoma. These are the ones that have ERB-B2. Comedocarcinomas are famous for the ERB-B2 uh, oncogene. Uh, so they're pretty aggressive cancers. Okay, this is invasive uh, uh, cancer. You can see these uh, tumor cells invading the stroma. This is what uh, you probably were told was Indian filing. And they probably told you that's a sign of invasive lobular cancer. That's true, but you also can see it in infiltrating ductal actually more often. This is called Indian filing. So these are all examples of infiltrating cancers. That's the nipple, guys, and you see kind of an eczematous rash around the nipple. So you please tell me what it is. Paget's disease. Anytime you see in an older woman a rash on the nipple, a rash on the nipple, okay, make sure you feel underneath that nipple and always get a mammogram. It's probably Paget's. And what it is, is a cancer of the duct underneath that has spread up into the skin and produced this rash-like thing. When you biopsy it, it looks exactly like what I showed you in the bulb, exactly like it, except this is in the breast, the nipple. They love Paget's disease of the breast on exams. This is inflammatory carcinoma, the worst of the worst cancer. Okay, look, you can see how red it is. And why does this dimpled skin? It's been dimpled because the lymphatics are plugged with cancer underneath there. And the lymphatic fluid is leaked out. And the, and the ligaments that are attached to the skin now, they are still, but you're increasing the fluid in interstitium, and so as it expands out, it dimples, looking like an orange, peau de orange. I'm probably saying it wrong, but this is inflammatory carcinoma. What they're interested in, why does it look like that? It's lymphatics filled with tumor. That's lymphatic tumor, lymphatic tumor, lymphatic tumor. The worst of the worst. This is lobular carcinoma. That's the most common cancer of the terminal Lobules, that's at the end of the ducts. What did I say it was famous for? Bilaterality, very good. Okay. And what is this? Huh. That's lymphedema in a woman post-radical mastectomy. Now remember when you do a post-radical, when you do a, radi a modified radical mastectomy, what are you removing? The entire breast, including nipple. You're leaving behind the pectoralis major. You're doing an axillary resection. resection. Uh, you're also usually taking the pectoralis minor with it. Most common complication that they like on anatomy is the wing scapula. That means you cut the long thoracic nerve. Okay, so that's a common complication of that because you cut the long thoracic nerve and you get wing scapula. Now, the, the, uh, the lumpectomy thing, it removes the... Uh, the, uh, the, the uh, the underlying tumor, okay, removes the underlying tumor with a good border of, uh, of, the, uh, of normal tissue around it, okay. They take a few nodes from the lower axillary chain because they have to use that for staging. You have to get lymph nodes because they usually go to the lower axillary first. And then you do radiation of the breast after that. It has the same prognosis and everything else as an actual modified radical mastectomy. So that's good for breast conservation. If it fits the criteria, if they're too big, the tumors, then they have to do a modified radical. Lastly, ERA, PRA, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor assay. What does it mean? 
Well, just think about this. Well, I'll still give you your time. Let's just finish this thing. Just don't worry. I'm type A on this thing. What does it mean? Well, I'm going to show you how to think about it and you don't have to memorize this. Isn't there some kind of relationship between the presence of estrogen and its receptor synthesis? Yes or no? So if you were in the reproductive period of your life when estrogen is abundant, then what would you do to your receptors? Downregulate them. And so that's why women that are young in a reproductive period of their life have a breast cancer. They're usually ERA, PRA negative because that's what you would expect because estrogen would downregulate receptor synthesis, and that's true. Whereas if you're postmenopausal and estrogen levels are a bit lower, then you get upregulation of your receptors, and that's why most postmenopausal women are ERA, PRA positive. There's nothing magic about that. But what does it mean? What it means if it's ERA, PRA positive is that it's responding to estrogen, that tumor. And so you need to take away that estrogen effect because it's feeding the tumor. Now, now how are you going to take it away? You're going to give them tamoxifen. Because, uh, because Trevor taught you that tamoxifen is a weak estrogen. And so it hooks into the receptors on the breast tumor if there's any left behind so that the normal estrogen in a woman, what little may be there, can't get into that and therefore feed the tumor. So it's a blocker. It's blocking the receptor. But does it have complications? Yeah, you have menopausal type symptoms after you're on it. And another thing is, is that it is an estrogen, and so you have the risk of endometrial cancer. A benefit of tamoxifen in a postmenopausal woman with an ERA, ERA positive tumor is that it does prevent osteoporosis. And so, you know, you can't give estrogen to a woman if she has a cancer that's ERA, PRA positive, contraindication. But she is a candidate, candidate for tamoxifen, and so that will protect them. And at the same time, uh, uh, prolong the, uh, the, uh, the time frame that possible recurrence can occur. Okay, that's it. Let's break for a full 10 minutes. That's going to be around a little after 5 after.